The subject of repentance is a very controversial subject, and there is a lot of debate back and forth among Christians about what repentance is. And the best way to find out what repentance is, is to go to the Bible, the King James Bible. The word repentance in the Bible can have more than one definition. And many times people will pick the definition they prefer and claim repentance only means what they choose it to mean. Some claim it means only a change of mind, while some say it means being sorry. Some say it means turning from something, and some say it means to quit sinning. But first off, we see repentance means a change of mind. In Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So God changed his mind about the evil he was going to do to the Ninevites, and he did it not. So God isn't turning from sins or stopping sinning because God doesn't sin. So repentance doesn't always mean quit sinning or to turn from a certain sin. The definition of repentance here is obviously a change of mind. And next we see how repentance can mean to be sorry. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 and 10 says, Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And the context of these verses is that the Corinthian church repented and got right with God. It was a saved people repenting. But the verses show two kinds of repentance. A person can be sorry they got caught in their sin, and this would be worldly sorrow. While the person who has godly sorrow is sorry for who they are. Matthew 27, 3 shows us a person who was sorry they got caught. It says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. So Judas, the man who betrayed Jesus, he, rep he was sorry and he repented. And Judas died and went to his own place. He, Judas is not in heaven. And then in Luke eighteen thirteen, you have someone who was sorry and repented for who they were. They were sorry that they were a sinner. Luke eighteen thirteen says, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. So the publican had godly sorrow, he saw himself as a sinner. And real godly sorrow makes you sorry for what you are and not just a certain sin. And this godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. So how is repentance involved in salvation? We know that it is involved because of verses like Second Peter 2 or Second Peter 3 and verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you see, repentance is involved in salvation. And you have men who are all about mentioning repentance when telling someone how to be saved, and then you have men who are scared to talk about repentance. And this is because repentance has been turned into quit your sin to be saved. So automatically, when someone hears, Someone say, repent and be saved. They're thinking he's saying, quit sinning and then believe. But that's not what repentance to salvation is. And then if you look at Acts 20 and verse 21, it says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we see that repentance is turning towards something. When you get saved, you have realized you are a guilty sinner and that your own righteousness will not get you into heaven. And the Holy Spirit pricks the heart of a lost man about his sinful condition. If you look at John chapter 16 verses 8 through 10, it says, And when he, was, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. 
of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So what is the sin the Holy Spirit reproves the world of? In verse 9, it said of sin because they believe not on me. So the sin the Holy Spirit convicts a man of is his unbelief in Jesus Christ. The only sin that sends a man to hell is dying in his unbelief. So when you get saved, you realize your guilt of sin. You realize your self-righteousness is no good and that it can't get you to heaven. Before the Holy Spirit pricked your heart about your sinful condition, you were thinking in your mind that everything was okay. And then after he pricked your heart, you had a change of mind. In your, in your mind, you realized you were a guilty sinner. You realized your own good works was going to lead you to hell. And you turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. You changed your mind about your sin and about yourself. And that was repentance that resulted in you turning to Jesus Christ for salvation. You changed your mind about your own righteousness and turned to Jesus Christ and His righteousness. And that is what Acts 20.21 20, is talking about when it says, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. An excellent example in the Bible of someone who realized their righteousness is not worth anything and that it's completely no good and can't get them to heaven and realize that they need the righteousness of Jesus Christ, someone who truly realized this is the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, it says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So Paul lists all the good works he did when he was an unsaved Pharisee. Then in verse 8, it says he counts them but dung. And that is because his own righteousness is no good, and he realized his righteousness is filthy rags. Then in verse 9, he talks about being found in Jesus Christ, not having his own righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which he got through the faith of Christ. So he had a change of mind. At one point, he thought all that stuff he was doing was good. He thought persecuting the church of God and wasting it was a good thing. But then he turned from those things and turned to Jesus Christ. He didn't quit sinning to be saved. He had a change of mind about who he was and about the things he was doing, and he turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are lost and you need to see all the good things about yourself, those things are actually filthy rags in the sight of God. And none of those things are good enough to get you to heaven. You need to repent, that is, change your mind about yourself, turn from your own self-righteousness, and turn to Jesus Christ and His righteousness. You need to realize what you are, and that is a sinner. Jesus Christ provided, or Jesus Christ proved he was righteous when he rose from the dead. And the Bible says, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, after you have realized your guilt of sin, that your self righteousness can't get you to heaven, you believe the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ putting your trust in that alone to get you to heaven. After you do this, you then need to do works meet for repentance. In Acts 26, 20, it says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Notice that the works don't have anything to do with your salvation. You repented and turned to God, 
and the works are a completely separate thing. We need to do good works after salvation. And we need to feel obligated to do these good works because of what Jesus Christ did for us and because God says himself he wants us to do good works. But the works aren't connected with us obtaining or maintaining the salvation. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There is no doubt about it. We need to do right. We need to serve God and do what he wants us to do. But this isn't connected with keeping our salvation. After you are saved, there is another kind of repentance. And this repentance has to do with turning from individual sins. And this turning from individual sins is not to stay saved. You're saved. You're eternally secure. But there's verses in the Bible that show repentance can mean turning from individual sin. Revelation 2.22 says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So if you drink, fornicate, cuss, lust, envy, watch pornography, drink, uh, smoke, or any other sin that may be in your life, then you need to repent of those sins, turn away from those sins, and get them out of your life. Not to stay saved, but to have better fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 12.21 says, Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. So here Paul talks about Christians who haven't repented of fornication and lasciviousness. If a Christian stays in these sins, then he will die. Second uh, Corinthians thirteen five says, "Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates." So we need to examine ourselves daily. We need to have a daily confession of sins. Spiritually, God sees me as sinless as Jesus Christ because I'm saved and I have his righteousness, but my flesh still sins and needs to be kept in check. And that is the difference between your standing and your state. My standing with God is that I'm sinless. God sees me as sinless because I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My state, however, is how I'm living in the flesh at a certain time. And I should try my best to get my state to match my standing as close as I can get them to match. But you're not going to get them to be able to match perfectly because you still have this same sinful flesh that you had before you got saved. But a saved man has two natures. He has the new man and he has the old man. And now once a person is saved... There are going to be men that will say, if you are still drinking and smoking and cussing and so on and so forth, then you really didn't get saved. But like I said before, the doing works meet for repentance is a separate issue than salvation. And a saved person has two natures. He can walk in the spirit and please God, or he can live for the flesh and walk in the flesh. And that's why that's even mentioned by Paul. Why does Paul tell us not to walk in the flesh if we can't walk in the flesh? Since the saved man still has sinful flesh, he can still do the works of the flesh, as awful as that is. And people think when you say these things that you're condoning people doing that stuff, but that's not true. And when they say that, they're using the same argument a holiness preacher would use against a Baptist. The holiness preacher will say, well, you can't teach eternal security because then the people will just do what they want to do. And then the Baptist who says a person has to have works after he's saved to truly be saved, he'll tell you that if you say a person can live, a saved person can actually backslide and live like a lost person, he'll say if you teach that, then you're encouraging them to live bad. That's not true. What per a person does with their liberty is on them, and they're going to be judged for living wrong. But Galatians 5, 19 through 21 names off the works of the flesh. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, 
uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And how many times have you heard a preacher say a person isn't saved because he is committing committing one of the sins listed in Galatians five nineteen through twenty one? Many times. But they don't understand a person can still commit the works of the flesh. A Christian can get so far off into sin that he is desensitized to sin. The temptation of man is to look for outward evidence in another Christian, and they want to tell their outward works. They want to tell by those outward works if they are saved or not saved. And you can't do that because the regeneration is spiritual and your flesh doesn't get born again. You still have the same flesh and that's why we get a new body at the rapture. And you will hear many preachers talk about how every saved person will eventually have a changed life and will eventually show evidence of salvation. What they mean is a Christian won't drink won't cuss, won't fornicate, won't shack up or do any vile sin that man can see with their eyes. They forget all about all the inward sins that man can cover up like jealousy and lust. And then in the, the sins that people don't really even consider sins like complaining and worrying and gossiping. You can still do all those things and still can considered to have be considered to have a changed life. But if you're doing these other sins that man can see and that they see as vile and wretched, then you're not really saved is what they'll say. And these men who teach a guy has to have a changed life to be saved will just focus on the outward evidence because they themselves have outward evidence. And they will also focus on the sins they aren't committing themselves personally. For example, if they aren't smoking and cussing and fornicating, then they will use those sins to judge whether another person is saved or lost. If another person is cussing and smoking and fornicating, then they'll say, well, I doubt they're saved if they're doing those things. But what about their sins? Their uh, temptation in their flesh, they won't judge a man on that sin. Um, the fruit inspection leads to Christians digging up dirt on other Christians. If a Pharisee preacher dislikes another preacher and he can't find any sin on that preacher, then he will begin to try and dig up dirt on that preacher so he can expose him as a lost man. And this is done in an effort to make himself feel more spiritual himself. But proof that a Christian can live for the flesh is shown in the Bible when it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Not everyone at the judgment seat of Christ is going to rack up on crowns and precious stones and silver and gold. A good majority of them are probably going to get wood, hay, and stubble. And this shows that they aren't walking in the spirit in this life. They were living for the flesh. And if a Christian will always end up doing God's work and serving God, then why is there a sin unto death? And then in Romans 8, 13, it says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Why is this verse even in the Bible if every Christian is eventually going to show outward evidence and just going to look like a great Christian before everybody's eyes? A Christian can live for the desires of the flesh, and this will take him to an early grave. Then you still have the men who will say, well, the Christian is still going to show some kind of evidence somewhere if he is really saved. And it is impossible to judge a person's salvation off of outward evidence. For one thing, you aren't seeing a person's life from the time they got saved until the time that they die. Maybe they had evidence at one point and you didn't see it. Maybe they don't have evidence now, but they will later on in the future. The whole idea of inspecting someone's fruit is a waste of time. When you start focusing on everyone else's sin instead of your own is when you get self-righteous and when you start doubting everyone's salvation except your salvation. And you have these preachers now who basically believe they're the only ones that are saved. They're going around saying, this preacher's going to hell, this preacher's going to hell. Even preachers that have been preaching 40 years and say the true gospel, they'll say they're going to hell because they believe that the earth is a different shape than they believe it is or that the rapture happens at a different time than they think it happens. And no wonder they are so depressed 
because they don't have anyone to fellowship with because everyone else is lost according to them. And they will eventually come out with a list of sins that a Christian won't commit, which is nonsense. And to have a changed life according to them, you have to live up to their standards, their list of do's and don'ts. So if you want to be saved, then you need to come to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit may be convicting you about your sinful state right now at this moment, letting you know that your self-righteousness is absolutely no good and will not get you into heaven. And He does this because He wants you to repent by acknowledging yourself as a no-good sinner who can't save himself and turning to Jesus Christ. Repentance and believing the gospel go together. For a man to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to pay for his sins, he's going to have to realize he is a sinner. How can you believe on Jesus Christ to pay for your sins when you don't even really believe you are a sinner? You need to realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior, which would mean you realize you are no good and you have sorrow over who you are. You, you have a changed mind if you do this. You have a changed mind about yourself. And this means you're going to turn from the sin of unbelief. The sin of unbelief is what's keeping you out of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. If you want to be saved, then believe that gospel. Don't just believe it happened, but actually put your trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross to pay for your sins. Rely on that alone to get you into heaven. Romans ten thirteen says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you realize you are a sinner and you want to be saved, then call on the name of the Lord. Acts sixteen thirty one says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Don't let anyone deceive you about salvation. People are going to try to make salvation hard. But the Bible says there is simplicity in Christ. So I hope you'll be saved today if you're not saved.